Hello everybody, this is our Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, today we're continuing our study of the book of Acts. I think this is our 13th or 14th episode. Uh, we're in chapter 10 now. Uh, chapter 10, verse 30 is where we'll begin today. And we'll see how far we can get in 90 minutes or 2 hours. Uh, before we get started though, uh, Brother Joe, Brother Ted, will you say hi to everybody? Uh, this is uh, Joe from the Sebastian Dresden channel, uh, channel for fellowship and learning. And uh, feel free to come on over and sub if you like. Uh, looking forward to uh, continuing the lesson or the study. Back to you. All right, I'm Ted. Go ahead. Okay, this is uh, Ted from God's Truth Ministries channel, God's Truth Ministries, and uh, we've got some videos on there for uh, getting the gospel out and edifying the saints, and I hope you guys will stick with us here in the book of Acts. Back to you. Uh, all right. Uh, well, this, this portion of Acts, the last couple of chapters, the whole book's been really exciting for me, but uh, this portion right here is real exciting because we're, we're seeing for the very, very first time uh, the gospel being presented to Gentiles. And so uh, that's the point we're at right now where um, Cornelius, who is a Gentile centurion, and, and he God gives him a vision uh, about Peter and him, and there's a need for him to speak to Peter. Uh, and then Peter gets also a vision that uh, uh, unclean foods, and we, he should not consider any foods unclean, and further than that, you should not consider any man unclean, per, particularly Gentiles. So there's a, there's a totally new um, um, attitude, mindset here that Peter's presented with, is that uh, he, he, we're getting to see the beginnings of the end of of Judaism as, as are all the tenets and practices of uh, that religion starting with the dietary laws and then also we're, we see that the beginnings of um, this a new attitude towards Gentiles and it's not so easy for the the Jewish people to give up their um, their bad feelings about Gentiles even Peter in the in the last study uh, you can see that uh, uh, he has his reservations about talking to a Gentile, and God gives him his vision. One of the things that I liked that, that came out in the study the other day was that uh, this this vision of the unclean food was not only about food, but more importantly, just the fact that uh, he should not consider Gentiles as unclean either. So that was a it's a revolutionary uh, new attitude that he's being told by God about uh, Gentiles. And so that's where we'll we'll pick up now. Anything else before we get started? Anything else that we need to lay as a, a groundwork here? Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Chapter ten, verse thirty. And Cornelius said, um, he's speaking to uh, Peter now. Uh, Four days ago, I was fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon, a tanner, by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Uh, Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, whoever is going to go first today, go ahead. Your, tur your turn, Ted. Okay, no problem. Um, I think the thing here is that, uh, you know, I'm sure as soon as Peter is hearing this, guys, I'm sure he's thinking, wow, this is exactly what I was, you know, getting in my vision. So 
obviously God was at work simultaneously. You know, you've got the angel uh, appearing to Cornelius, uh, telling him, hey, you know, your prayers have been heard, uh, your life has been seen, it, it goes up to God, it's, it's not hidden from his side. He, uh, the things you do are not in vain, Cornelius, the, the angel is essentially telling him. And then Peter's hearing Cornelius uh, give him the story of, of what happened with the angel appearing to him and telling him, and Peter's like going, that's exactly the message I got on my end of the, not my end of town, but <laughs> where I was. Uh, so, I mean, it's just a confirmation to, to Peter, and it just uh, probably really confirms in his mind, you know, uh, the things Peter's heard, that he's not to call anything or anyone, more importantly, any man, uh, unclean. So uh, that's what I'm getting so far. Back to you, brother. All right, thanks. Uh, brother Joe? Yeah, I, I want to I wanna hit on something Ted said. They, they were, I just, just came to me, they were both fasting, or at least they were both hungry uh, at the same time that they received these visions. And so I find that remarkable. Uh, and again, I like what Ted said, God has a way of confirming things. Now in my life, and I, I suppose in your guys' too, uh, God does things like that. You know, well, he was fasting and I was fasting. We're both hungry. We both received the word. You know, it does confirm. Uh, God has a funny way of confirming things that uh, uh, I think was present here. The larger issue that springs to my mind, and I don't, and Luke, you can slap my knuckles with the ruler later if you want, but i got to say it. This is uh, most interesting to me because here we have a Gentile who's not associated with the, the nation of Israel. He's not associated, evidently, with any religion. And yet, he's in communion with God. This man is a believer in the way the Old Testament saints were believers, without a name to attach to the person that he's communing with. This is almost like Abraham back before God revealed his name. And so we have a, what we have here is a Gentile Abraham, someone that's walking in communion with God, who does not know his name, who does not know anything about laws or anything else, just like Abraham, and God is revealing to him, and Ted hit on this heavily yes, or last time we studied together, and I never forgot what you said, Ted, that was very good. Uh, it was uh, that God gives a little light, and how we respond to it, he gives greater light. How we respond to it, he gives increasing light. And so uh, this Gentile strikes me as a New Testament Abraham for the Gentile world, almost. And so uh, I find that to be utterly fascinating. Okay, and that's, that's all I'm thinking right now. Back to you. Mm hmm Hmm. Where's my ruler? I need that ruler so I can smack him on the back of his hand. Now, actually, <laughs> don't be afraid of me. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not always out to correct you, uh, but I, in, in this case, I, I, I agree with everything you just said. The, the, the issue last time was the question about Cornelius being um, a Jew in any respect. And uh, we needed to understand that he was not a Jew in any way. He wasn't a Jew by birth. He wasn't a proselyte, a convert to Judaism. He didn't practice Judaism in any way. He was a full Gentile. And that's why, uh, you know, Peter doesn't even want to have anything to do with him initially. Uh, and, uh, and also that uh, there's such a big fuss by James and the Jerusalem church when they discover he talked to this guy who's a Gentile. Uh, and, and that's why it's such a revolutionary date in history, uh, because he's completely Gentile. Uh, and, and guess what? Uh, uh, Abraham was Gentile. There were no Jews at the time of Abraham. There was no Israel. There were no Jews. So um, uh, I think your, your thoughts on that are really very good. Now, regarding Ted's comment about the they received, I think he said they received exactly the same. I don't know if you... I don't think you really intended that they seem they did not really get exactly the same vision. Uh, 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 Peter's vision 
was um, was uh, with this sheet and this food, these unclean foods, all that stuff was included in his vision. And then the conclusion was that, hey, don't call foods unclean, don't call any man unclean. And uh, uh, the other vision was, um, uh, there, there's none of those details in that vision that I can recall. It's just simply that he had a vision that he needed to speak to Peter, whose surname is uh, Simon, whose surname is Peter. And uh, unless I'm mistaken, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the significant thing, though, that you, you hit on there is, of course, they both had visions, and that should be a confirmation to both sides. Oh, wait, you had a vision? I had a vision, too. You had, I had a vision. I, I needed to speak to you. And, oh, I had a vision. God told me I had to speak to you. That's the really the, uh, the fantastic part of this that confirms to both of them that God is involved in this. Um, all right, before I go on, any more thoughts on any of that? Okay, I'll read yeah, I guess I guess the thing I wanted to point out was was after Peter's, I guess I didn't specify, the, the thing about after Peter's vision probably was uh, 19 and 20 in verse 10, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit's what revealed to him. Uh, the Spirit gave him uh, the revelation of, the three men seek thee, you know, I have sent them, don't doubt them, etc., etc. But um, I think uh, I wanted to hit on the very last verse you read um, as we were going in, uh, as he went into the house of uh, Cornelius there, where he said, uh, you know, Corn Cornelius is talking to Peter, immediately therefore I sent to thee that thou hast uh, well done and thou art come. And the very last sentence is kind of funny. Uh, now therefore... We are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded of you by God. You know, it's like, okay, Peter, this is why we all gathered today. I know neither Joe nor I hit on that, but I heard you laugh when you were reading that last sentence of that last verse there. And it's like, uh, you know, it's like, Peter, don't let us down here. It's kind of what it sounds like. Uh, we're all gathered to hear what you have to say on behalf of God. Uh, no pressure, buddy. <laughs> Back to you. Uh, I, I'm really, really glad you uh, you went back to that because actually uh, it was my intention to talk about that verse, but then based on both of your comments, it, it took me off on those other tangents there. But uh, that was really what I thought was really in, important for us to, to get here is that uh, um, Cornelius knows that he needs to uh, Peter to come over and speak to them about something. And it's urgent. And and Peter knows uh, that um, now he's supposed to speak to, to uh, Cornelius, but there's no uh, indication. There's uh, there. What's he supposed to tell him? He, he certainly, he's he, he's not going to tell him the old news and can try to convert him to, to Judaism. He's telling the, the the new news, the good news about Jesus. This is really what's important now, and so. Peter realizes that's the message God has for him to uh, tell Cornelius. Um, now, uh, let me see, where was I? It says, uh, now therefore are we all here present before God. So they're all they're really anxious to hear what Peter has to say. They know this is of uh, utmost importance to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Uh, the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. Um, well, I could... It's going to be a while, uh, this whole message, so I don't want to go too far. But let me stop at the end of verse 37 here. Go ahead. Well, there's there's a lot there, brother. And I think his very first, you know, the opening statement of Peter in verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I mean, we know still, you know, at this time God is still dealing with the nation of Israel, you know, uh, kind of in a, in a preeminent way, They're, they have the preeminence in, in, this, in the fact that 
they're supposed to be that nation that uh, is a light to the Gentiles. Uh, but uh, as far as individual persons, you know, God is in a God is in a respecter of, of persons, individuals. But in every nation, he that feareth God, an individual that fears God, uh, respects him, uh, or works righteousness, is accepted with him. So obviously Cornelius fit that category of being an individual person, you know, not belonging to the nation of Israel, but an individual person who feared God is respected by God, somebody who obeys him. And the message of God uh, was sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. I think that's interesting, brother, that, and I didn't even notice when you're reading it there. But that's in parentheses. It's kind of, to me, it's kind of like, by the way, <laughs> he is Lord of all. He is Lord of all people. So anybody who's going to call on him uh, is going to be accepted by God. Uh, this is why I've said before, Luke, and in some of our other broadcasts, that... Uh, God's eager to save people. He's he's always got the door open. Uh, his uh, you know he's like the father in the parable of the prodigal son, to where he's he had to have almost been looking for the prodigal son to come back home to come to him, and uh, he is Lord of all. Uh, uh, and verse thirty seven, that word I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John preached, and he's going to get into John the Baptist. Obviously, this guy had heard uh, about Jesus of Nazareth and the whole stir that he caused. I think this, this Roman centurion, Cornelius, had a definite knowledge that Jesus Christ was, was someone more than just a reli uh, religious rabble-rouser, you know, uh, that he truly was someone who was from God. We're going to see what Peter points out here, how distinct <laughs> this, this guy was, this Jesus of Nazareth. And um, that Cornelius, because of the light he had been uh, uh, not only given but heeding to, guys, uh, I think uh, this has opened up the door to, for Peter to come in and share this, uh, you know, so-called advanced truth, the, the more more light, more light, more light uh, to someone who who wanted the light that he had as a Gentile. Uh, back to you. Okay. All right. Thanks, Brother Joe. Yeah. Uh, again, with the uh, uh, with the thought of increasing light, I think that's gonna that is interesting and will continue to be uh, throughout this uh, this book. Um, I had notes uh, in my in my Bible. Uh, someone we all I think respect is someone named Walter Martin, and years and years ago, uh, he wrote an article called uh, "Of Gods and Dogs." And uh, it's all about this chapter. My notes <laughs> are correct. And it was taken from something, either scripture or the Matthew Henry commentary, I can't remember. But the only notes that I wrote from that article, and, and this, these are 20-year-old notes, guys, <laughs> is that God uh, didn't expressly tell the Israelites to socially avoid uh, all Gentiles. It was originally... the Anamites and the Edomites, uh, and I don't know what book that was in, but it was in the Old Testament. And then uh, the rabbis kind of extended that to, over time to all Gentiles, and so it was. It's more of a re rabbinical ritual uh, thing where all Gentiles are unclean. But to begin with, God's admonition was to specific nations, and and. I had written Anamites and Edomites only. And, oh, I wrote Deuteronomy 23, so I do have the reference. And uh, so uh, uh, I think that the rabbinical uh, priesthood kind of extended it beyond what God had intended, uh, maybe. And uh, I wish I could revisit the article that, that uh, Walter Martin wrote, but I couldn't find it anywhere So uh, online. So anyway, uh, I think that... Uh, that Peter is expressing here that uh, people are neither dogs nor gods. Uh, we're all on the same footing uh, in God's sight uh, through Christ. And just notes I had in my Bible. Back to you. Mm -hmm. hmm. 
Very good. Um, I'm glad you sure glad you said that. The um, uh, I I remember Jesus condemning uh, the religious leaders, uh, uh, and the term that he used was their teaching and following uh, traditions of men. And um, I've often compared the Roman Catholic religion uh, uh, to um, the, this pharisaical type of strict religious thing where they had uh, a particular way the clergy would have to dress and all, all these different uh, um, things that have developed through traditions. Some of them were spelled out in Levitical laws, so it became a very legalistic, ceremonial um, uh, type of religion, and so much like Roman Catholicism is practiced. Uh, but Jesus said that there's these traditions of men, and, and what he's referring to is what you you just cited there, is that you know God did tell them, uh, the, the Jewish people, that here are some laws that apply to you. These laws were not given to the whole world. They were given just to the nation of Israel. Um, and, but there are 613 of them, and, and, and uh, they were all written down, uh, and 10 of them were written on stone, the Ten Commandments. But all 613 laws God gave, and there's, they're very specific, and each one has a, a purpose. Uh, but uh, then the, 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 from the time of Moses to the time of Jesus, all the religious leaders, the rabbis, the teachers, uh, and they started adding things to it. These are the traditions of men, the teachings of the rabbis. And uh, there's there a lot of things they added. Uh, they, they said, for example, uh, you can't work on the Sabbath. You're supposed to rest. So how do you define that? They, they got very precise. They said, well, you can... You're not allowed to take um, pick up an object any larger than certain dimensions, and, and you cannot you cannot carry it more than a prescribed number of steps. If it's either larger or more steps, then you violate this resting on the Sabbath. You're working. So these these rabbis they they added to this and put more Jesus burdens on them, on everybody, uh, and so. This is another thing that you're bringing to my attention. I haven't heard it before, but it certainly fits and makes an awful lot of sense in my mind that, well, yeah, this, this why are, do not the Jews, would the Jews not associate with the Gentiles? Um, uh, if you're correct, then, then there was a time when God said they couldn't associate with a particular few tribes of, of people, and he had his reasons. Uh, probably because they they would mix their relation religion and taint Judaism. Uh, I have a, a, a friend now that years ago he he said that he thought that thou shalt not commit adultery in the in the Ten Commandments. Uh, he he interpreted that and uh, as uh, not uh, sexual adultery, but adultery of race mixing mixing the races and mixing of their religion. Keep Judaism pure, keep the Jewish race of people pure, don't intermarry, don't bring their religion into it, otherwise you've adulterated, you've made it impure, uh, their, their religion. Um, I'm not saying, I, I think that's a, a, is an appropriate work, use of the word adultery or adulterate. I, I'm not saying that the 10th commandment applies to that as he did, but it, it is, uh, important for us to understand that God gave specific laws, but man added to it, and, and uh, uh, this is possibly something that man, that the Jewish people, uh, the Jewish leaders added, is that you can't associate with the Gentiles at all. Um, so, in this case, getting back to the text now, uh, some things I wanted to say there. This idea of uh, God is no respecter of persons. That sounds familiar, 34. Um, uh, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. Most certainly I understand now that God is not one to show partiality to people as though Gentiles were excluded from God's blessing. But in every nation, the person who fears God and does what is right by seeking him is acceptable and welcomed by him. Um, 
I, I think the idea of uh, respecter of persons, this is an Old Testament um, uh, phrase. Uh, I'm not positive, but I, I suspect it is. Uh, but the, here, the way that uh, he's saying respecter of persons, he's not showing, doesn't show partiality. Uh, but in verse 35 in the Amplified, it says, But in every nation, the person who fears God and does what is right by seeking him is acceptable and welcomed by him. I think it's important to understand verse 35 in that way because it, if we read it in the KJV, it says, But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So what, do we, what happens when you see the term worketh righteousness? Uh, immediately, <laughs> you have the... Uh, the, the largest faction in Christendom are those people that think religious works on our part are required to get saved and stay saved. And we, we, we fight against it every day, saying, pointing out scriptures that, that says, To the man that worketh not, but believeth on the one who justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. We could give you 20 verses that clearly state this, that works are not required for salvation. Religious work is not required at all. Um, and yet, you look at a verse like this, and this is exactly the kind of verse that the, the works salvationist, the lordship salvationist, they say, see, it's saying works righteousness. But I think it should be understood better as it states it here in the Amplified, and that is, you know the message which he sent to the... Oh, I'm sorry. Verse 30, but in every nation, the person who fears God and does what is right by seeking him is acceptable and welcome to him. So what is the, the, the works righteousness that a person needs to do apart from uh, getting it from the, the Jews? Those, those people, they needed to seek God. And it seems to me that Cornelius is one of these people like Abraham, that Joe, you compared him to, that he had a mind that he desired to know God. And in that case... Uh, as uh, Peter says, he is accepted with him. Um, all right, I guess I've gone on enough on that. Any, any more thoughts before we keep reading? Uh, I, I just, I'm just uh, recalling uh, I grew up in a, a Southern Baptist environment uh, of a little bit of work salvation, or maybe a lot, I'm not sure. But uh, I remember that... Uh, uh, the pastor, uh, Pastor Green at the Lansing Baptist Church, a uh, little short, stout fellow, about 300 pounds, five foot four, used to sweat like crazy, carry a white handkerchief and wipe his sweat as he went back and forth on the platform every week, scaring the hell out of everybody that wasn't saved. You know, if they didn't get saved, they're going to hell quick. He, he used to always say, God ain't talking to you if you, you're not a believer in him. He ain't talking to you. He's got one word for you. Repent. <laughs> so evidently there is such a thing uh, as increasing life uh, that I'm so glad Ted pointed out yes, the last time. I think there is such a thing as, uh, as increasing life. You know, how we respond to the light God gives draws us to him. And in the case of this Gentile like Abraham, uh, methodically until God does reveal himself. Back to you, Luke. That's all I have. Uh, any more, Ted, before I read on? Okay. All right. Back to the back to the scriptures. Um, I'll start with verse 36. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him, God, raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. That's verse 41. So, Brother Ted? Wow. 
This is an excellent, excellent part portion of scripture here. Uh, I mean, it's just it's just amazing that, uh, that P this is a sermon right here within a, within a few lines of what Peter says. I mean, talks about God's no respecter of persons. I mean, this is this is very evangelistic. I mean, you talk about Peter just cutting to the chase right here. Um, you know, back in verse 34, God's no respecter of persons. Just saying, we as, you know, we talked about this in the last bit, Luke, sorry to reiterate, but, uh, you know, we're all in this thing together. God's no respecter of persons, Jew, Gentile, anything. Uh, the, and the message that uh, God sent unto the ch children of Israel, I said in my last little uh, blurb there about, you know, Israel still had a place of preeminence as far as being the, uh, the agency, the conduit, however you want to term that, through which God would make them a, uh, a nation of, of kings and priests. You know, he prophesied in the Old Testament that they would be a light to the Gentiles. God sent that to the children of Israel. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But Peter is making a broader point here, uh, and it's, it's to every nation and each person that fears him, and it's, it's this message that he's bringing peace by Jesus Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Uh, that word, that message, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea, beginning at Galilee, from which the baptism of John preached. This was not a secret, in other words. This is something God wanted to proclaim to not only the children of Israel, but to people for the whole world. However, he gets that out if 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 his apostles and the children of Israel are the agency through which it gets out, God wants to get it out, but he'll use whatever means to uh, get the message out, because like I said before, <laughs> this is what the Bible teaches, he's eager to save people. He wants salvation for people, which is the antithesis of Calvinism, uh, that aside. But, and God did this. He anointed Jesus of Nazareth, this one you, you people here in Cornelius' household. You've, you've heard about this Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, uh, he, uh, he was anointed with the Holy Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, with power. He went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And I think about that, and I think, look at all the ways that people were oppressed by the devil then. I mean, sometimes it was outright manifestations of, of demonic possession. But he doesn't say uh, possessed of the devil. He says oppressed. And I think that's a good distinctive because I've got in my margin here, and I need to look in the Amplified, uh, how it uh, says it here. Uh, uh, he was anointed with strength and power, and he went about doing good in the Amplified, in particular curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil, for God was with him, with Jesus. And I mean, we have to believe that that still goes on today. People think a demonic oppression or... Uh, demonic possession and things like that. We think we think in terms of, you know, Hollywood movies where a girl's little head turns around. That that's possessed, you know. But but it's not just that. We we, we know that nowadays uh, the devil is possessing and oppressing uh, many, many people. As many as 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 many as his demonic hordes can can oppress. We we've talked about the fact that Satan can only be one place at a time. We know that. He's the CEO. He's got. He delegates authority all over the place. I'm sure uh, us three can attest to the fact that uh, uh, probably uh, screw tape number five or whoever our personal demons are that harass us. They've probably been harassing us, knowing our weaknesses our whole lives. And that's just us as Christians, guys. Imagine uh, the demons that are assigned to to unbelievers, uh, folks. I, I think we really need to get this. But and Christ. Christ is the one who brings freedom from all that. Peter declares that right here. All, all who are oppressed uh, of the devil. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews, that wasn't a secret, and in Jerusalem, right there, our hometown, he says. Uh, and what happened there? It's what, what they did is they, they slew him. They killed him and hanged him on a tree, put him on the cross. That was their expression for the cross. But... God raised him up the third day. This once again here is here is in the book of Acts and Luke. I think you and I talked off the air about this uh, that the message uh, all through Acts that was reiterated by every apostle, 
not just Peter, not just Philip, Paul, uh, Luke, all, all that were in within that realm of, of ministry with Paul. Uh, the emphasis was, yeah, Jesus was here, of course, was a, a literal historical person. That there was no argument from stupid academia about that. But then not only did this Jesus Christ live and perform all these miracles that Peter talked about in verse 38, it was killed by the Romans, but he was raised the third day. The re resurrection, folks, is reiterated over and over and over again. If anything's reiterated in the book of Acts over and over and over, it's the resurrection that we serve a risen Christ. Uh, God raised him up on the third day not and, and showed him openly. In verse 41, look, you took a big passage, so I'm kind of going on here because you took so many verses, but i got to go through here. He didn't show the resurrected Christ. Christ didn't reveal himself to, uh, to unbelievers. Peter points that out. Now, he didn't uh, reveal himself to all the people, verse 41, but unto witnesses chosen before God. No unbelievers. No unbelievers. If somebody hasn't gotten this, get this now. And I just realized this, maybe I didn't think about it before, but just a few weeks ago. Christ only revealed himself after his resurrection, you know, in a physical manner. Um, he only revealed himself physically to, uh, to believers, to those people who had believed on him. Paul was the first one that was kind of one born out of due time. And then it was a blinding light, and we talked about that back in chapter 9. Even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. Paul says this wasn't just a spirit, wasn't just a ghost, you know, hanging around with us after his resurrection. Cornelius, we ate and drank with this guy. He rose physically from the dead. And this is what separates Christianity from spiritism and cults, is that we worship a, a truly raised, physically raised from the dead Christ. Uh, and how far did you go? Verse 42, And he commanded us to preach unto the people, and to testify that he which was ordained of God to be judge of the living and the dead. So uh, a real Christ, a resurrected Christ, and a Christ that's going to be the judge and is the judge of the living and the dead. Brother, there's a lot a lot in that passage, and I'll, I'll slow down and go back to you. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot, uh, Brother Joe. Yeah, the, the, the big problem with uh, having Ted go first is that uh, he sends me off on to different paths. You know, anything I may have been thinking before, it doesn't matter if I write them down or not. Now I'm going this way, uh, and rightly so here. You know, Randy Stonehill made a wonderful uh, song back in the 70s called It's a Great Big Stupid World. And uh, in it, he, he notes that if Jesus came back today, the first thing they'd try to do is book him on the Oprah Winfrey show. And and uh, and you can see that in, in, uh, like uh, like uh, Ted said, he didn't show himself to the scribes and the Pharisees. He didn't. He could have made a grand entrance at the uh, temple. Uh, he could have even went before the Caesar. I mean, this is God incarnate, uh, risen God. Uh, he could have done anything, shown himself to anyone. But what he do? He didn't. He showed showed himself to. 512 people, or 13, that were specially selected nobodies within the, the nation of Israel. And so there's something to be said there. You know, he, he, he promised Abraham way back when uh, that, uh, or Isaac, I'm not sure, Jacob maybe, he promised one of them that the nation of Israel would be used as his messengers, his kings and priests, to uh, enlighten the Gentile world uh, regarding uh, uh, the knowledge of God, and so be that blessing to the world. And so uh, that was part of the plan, and, and Christ didn't circumvent that. And uh, also what one of the things that, that came to mind is that this is really huge, because this is the first time that that promise made to Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, one of those guys, this is the first time that the fulfillment of that promise took the first step, and that is bringing the light of God to the Gentiles. This is the very first time this happened, right? I think if you don't count like Rahab and some of the people in the Old Testament who were, who were brought into the Jewish nation. So 
this is a, a very, very big deal. And, you know, those people that say, you know, the fall only is, well, right here, the, the fulfillment of that promise in the Old Testament was made by Peter here. And, and the last thing I'll say is uh, it's pretty quick. You know, it, it wasn't, you, Luke, you've mentioned many, many times that uh, when you see a, a sermon or a, a video on YouTube that says, how do we save, and it's an hour long, or it's a, a ten-part teaching series, <coughs> it's more of an indoctrination into religion rather than the uh, giving of the gospel. And so uh, Peter uh, sums it up pretty quickly here, and uh, and I think that's the, the purity of the, of the simple gospel. Back to you, Luke. Mm. Well done. You, you both covered that very well. Um, to me, you know, uh, I think, you know, the, Paul had a, a, a special calling to go to the Gentiles. Now, he was still faithful, you know, always preaching to the Jews first, but he, he did go and spread the gospel all around to the Gentiles areas, and he's called the apostle to the Gentiles. Um, I, I, think, I think maybe I have a special mission, too. Maybe at least in my own mind, I, I've formulated it, and I've taken this as a calling, and that is to proclaim to the people who teach that you can't get saved from anything apart from Romans through Philemon, the letters of Paul, and some of them even say you can't even get saved from anything except for First Corinthians chapter 15 verses three and four. This is how far they take it. When they say they are rightly dividing the word of God, they are the right divider. They're over dividing it. They're getting rid of everything else and just reducing it down to a couple of verses or or some letters of Paul. And so I have I've been uh, lost patience with them. So I've been on a campaign to expose them. And so right here, what do we see? I've said over and over again, Paul was not the first one to preach to Gentiles. It was Peter. Paul, Paul was not the first one to preach the gospel. No. So now let's test that. What was the gospel Paul preached? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Even the Paul only is saved. That's the gospel. Personally, I think the, 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 the gospel is, is I, if I want to s s summarize it into what a person really needs to get, is that uh, salvation's offer is a free gift to you. You can receive it freely, not through any religious works. That's the good news. But the means by which this is possible is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. So a person can believe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is factual without being saved if they never place their faith in him and what he's done for them and, and receive the gift. But the point I'm making is Paul preached this death, burial, and resurrection. Now what is Peter preaching here? The death, burial, and resurrection. And as we go a little further, you'll see he's for the remission of sins. So he died for our sins on that cross. He was buried. He's raised from the dead. Uh, it's exactly the same message, and it's preached um, uh, before Paul preached to any Gentile. There's no record of Paul preaching to any Gentiles yet. He preached in, in uh, immediately went out and preached to the synagogue when, after he got saved, but there's no record of Paul preaching to any Gentiles. This is the first case in history, and that's why... James and the Jerusalem church, when they found out about this, they're outraged. And uh, he's, uh, that's to me the most important thing from this is that Paul, I mean, Peter is preaching the same message that Paul later preaches. And there's a term, that, another term that Paul is famous for believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And uh, we're going to find out later when. Um, when Peter talks to James about all this, that's the term that he uses. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and were saved just as we were, and that, that because they they had the uh, the tongues as the testimony that they received the Holy Spirit. They had this. So he says it's the same thing as us. It's a and um, as a matter of fact, but but the Paul only would even say, well, James and those people, Peter and those people, they weren't even saved. <laughs> That's how crazy it is. They, they don't think Peter was even saved, isn't even in the church. They think the church began with Paul. Paul was the first member of the church, and the others are not even in the church. They're 
they have a different program for them. It's it's absolutely insane. Watch my playlist. Uh, Paul only is in debunked, and you'll see that all of their claims are easily refuted. But this one right here, this portion right here, certainly refutes that uh, the idea that Paul was the exclusive preacher of this gospel message. Uh, all right, I'm gonna. And before I go on, any more thoughts? Well, I, I was just uh, in in private message with uh, someone who put out the Romans through Philemon uh, uh, thoughts, and. They're good people, and I and good brothers and sisters. And uh, but you know because of this fellowship we have here, maybe it was on my mind a little much. But uh, you know we came up with the term a long time ago. Luke, uh, the the word says rightly divide. Well, that's talking about the Old Testament to the New Testament, the age of grace and the age of law. And uh, and somehow they've extended that to Paul, Romans through Philemon, uh, separated from everything else. And so I think. You know, uh, we need to be on a mission of rightly uniting the scriptures uh, in instead of uh, uh, incorrectly dividing them. But uh, that's my only thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it's it, uh, it's a it's a special gift you've got for coming up with a, a, a concise term or phrase that really says it all. And so we need to unite the Bible, make make see how it all fits together, and in fact, even the idea of the age of grace and the age of the law, I, I even disagree with that, is that everybody's got saved by grace alone, through faith alone, from the beginning of the Bible all the way through. No one's ever got saved through any religious works. And so it's always been by grace. Um, but uh, at a certain point, the nation of Israel, God gave them laws to follow. Okay, but to before and after Israel, uh, and of the whole world apart from the Israelites, uh, never had these laws. They just had the conscience God gave them. Um, so, um, yeah, it, we need to understand how the Bible, uh, it, it doesn't contradict itself. It, it says the same thing throughout the beginning, that man needed God to rescue them, and he was going to provide a Savior for them at some, in the future, and just have faith in that. And then later on, we discover that the Savior came. It's Jesus. And, and we just need to believe he is our Savior. Um, all right. We are not making a lot of fast progress. but um, Okay, so now uh, verse 42, I guess. I, and he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which is, was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness. I can't wait to talk about that, but you guys will certainly beat me to it, I'm sure. That through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall have remission of sins. Let me stop at verse 43. There's enough there. Okay, go ahead. Well, this is uh, an excellent, excellent passage. And Brother Luke, you talk about going off on, uh, at, you know, doing some correcting and being a voice uh, to correct the errors of uh, of certain groups who, uh, you know, want to want to claim the having the only uh, what do they call it? you know the right division and so forth. Uh, I really, considering my background and what I came from uh, from growing up in the Church of Christ, I absolutely have to. Uh, just to hit on this, verse 42 and 43 especially, he commanded us to preach to all the people. And, uh, you know, this is Peter's message. This is the message from the Lord God that he got, that he received, and he was to testify. And he said, and he, uh, we were to testify that he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead, the quick and the dead, to him gave all the prophets witness. This is nothing new, he's saying. Uh, just like you, you said, Luke, uh, there wasn't any salvation by works in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the Old Testament prophets never proclaimed salvation by works. It was always just a justification by faith. The just shall live, live by faith. Abraham believed God, and he was justified. Boom! At the moment of faith. Um, this is what all the, all the prophets said to, to him, to Jesus, give all the prophets witness. Uh, they bear witness. 
of this fact that through his name, whoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And uh, this is believing and getting forgiveness of sins before baptism. Now, people, the, the Church of Christ, the Disciples of Christ, and the Roman Catholics are the three main groups that come to mind, denominations that come to my mind, that believe that forgiveness of sins happens after baptism and won't happen until somebody is baptized. And the Catholics go so far as to say, you know, an infant being, you know, baptized receives, that's how they get forgiveness of sins, uh, you know, before they have committed any. So, I guess. But uh, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Not if, not maybe, not after you get baptized, but before baptism, they receive remission of sins, and we're going to see they receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if people want to go back to Acts 2.38 and misinterpret that verse, they can. But how about going before Acts 2.38 to Matthew 26.28? And I have to read this because we know Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost when he gave the message and, and the, the Israelites from all those regions said, uh, Sirs, what must we do? Or, or, what, or what about us? And Peter says, Repent. Uh, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. Well, what did Peter think brought about the remission of sins? What did Peter think brought about remission of sins? Let's see. Let's let's think about this. Hmm. My keen mind, not so keen, picks up on the fact that Peter, being full of the ghost, full of the Holy Ghost, might have known what Jesus said back in Matthew 26, 28, to whom Peter was there having dinner. <laughs> With Jesus said this when he's given them the uh, the Lord the, uh, the the being the Passover meal. Uh, Jesus took bread in verse 26 of Matthew 26. He took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, "Take, eat. This is my body." Verse 27. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, "Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the new testament or the new covenant." which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Now let's see. God's always had a blood economy. Forgiveness of sins has always been based on blood before the law, blood during the law, blood, 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 all through. These Israelites knew this. Jesus Christ, the Lord of all, who was the Lamb of God, Lamb who would take away the sins of the world, Jesus himself said this, in front of Peter, this is the new covenant, the new testament of my blood, my blood, which is shed for the remission of sins. Now, do you think when Peter got up in Acts 2, he's going to say, water is what provides, and you doing a work is going to pro provide remission of sins? No. Peter, being full of the Holy Spirit, knew that if someone repents, changes their mind, and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they receive remission of sins, get baptized in light of that fact. And now, Peter again, once again, just to double down on the fact, here's some Gentiles who are just uh, here to receive the word of God from, he, from Peter on behalf of Christ, his Lord, says this, to him gave all the prophets witness, nothing new, nothing new here, guys. He says, to him gave all the prophets witness that through his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, whoever believes in him shall receive remission of sins. It's by faith. It's by faith in what Christ. His blood was shed for remission of sins. And this brings in the new covenant. Things are changing. Uh, it, says, it says when we get to, well, we're not going to get into Hebrews, but in the book of Hebrews, the new covenant brought about this because of Jesus Christ who put away sins by the sacrifice of himself. It talks about it over and over again regarding the new covenant. So this is just the word to Gentiles. Gentiles didn't have a, an old covenant or a new covenant. Uh, the, the new covenant and the old covenant are, you know, the, the first, first covenant were things the Jews would have understand. All the Gentiles want to know is, you know, how do we get right before this God, this true God? And he's saying, all the prophets gave witness, guys, and here's the fact that whoever believes in this Redeemer, this Christ that God raised from the dead, whoever just believes in him is justified. 
They're justified from all things. And they receive remission of sins. And it's evident by the fact that, that Christ was the Lamb who took away the sins. Peter knew this, and he's just testifying it to these Gentiles. And they get the Holy Spirit and forgiveness of sins simply by faith. Uh, back to you, brother. Mm -hmm. Well, my question to, is to Brother Joe. Uh, how do we uh, get Ted to stop being so shy and tongue-tied, Brother Joe? Well, I, I, I was just about to say uh, that was a very thorough examination of the Scripture, and, and uh, I, I can't think of much to add. Uh, he covered it all uh, very, very well. You know, what, what did come to mind, was, you know, so many people like Ray Comfort and, and the crew that uh, go out in the street and uh, they approach people, uh, tell me, tell me, uh, have you ever told a lie? Uh, have you uh, ever lusted after a woman in your heart? Uh, you know, on and on they go uh, before they work their way, work their way to the gospel. And, you know, like you said once uh, recently, Luke, everybody knows that they're a sinner. I mean, our conscience is, unless it's been seared dramatically over the course of a lifetime, uh, people know. Even I, I take that back. Even they know. Everybody knows that they have a sin nature, that they do things that are not right. And uh, uh, it really puts the focus of salvation onto works, how we behave, uh, and so forth. The, the key word in all of this that, that Ted covered very well is belief. And uh, so uh, that's all I can add. Yeah. yeah, well, by the time it gets to me, it's been covered so thoroughly. Um, excellent points. Uh, I, I'm really happy, Brother Joe, that you brought up the Ray Comfort and uh, Kirk Cameron. They, they have a, a system of evangelism they call the Way of the Master. And, uh, you know, I, I, bought, I got all their books and all their audios, and I've studied it extensively. I know it as well as anybody. So I'm... I'm I'm not talking out of ignorance here, but it is a false message that they're preaching for salvation. They, Ray Comfort says it, the message is, and salvation is like a coin with two sides. First you repent of your sins, and then you can believe in Jesus. And then and you repent of your sins means you give them up. Not just you feel guilty, or, you know, you admit you're a sinner, but you give them up. So that's a, that's a damnable heresy. It's not just one, one uh, heretical idea that's a, that's a minor doctrine that is, uh, you know, that, okay, you don't have to be right on everything, but you better get this right. It's the difference between heaven and hell. This, this is that important. So uh, you, you did make a very good observation, Brother Show, that here, this entire gospel presentation that he's making to Cornelius and his family and friends is... Uh, he, he's not running them through the commandments and trying to convict them and admit they've sinned. He, he, he's saying that Jesus paid for our sin. Faith in him and your sins are remitted. It's just an assumption. Everybody knows that they've sinned. I, I, I've preached to publicly to more than a million people, and I'm not trying to say this. I don't like to say it very often. It may sound like I'm being boastful or something, but I've done a lot of free preaching. I've preached to enormous crowds, especially on holidays here in Las Vegas. And I've had i talked to probably thousands of people individually, one-on-one -on -one type conversations uh, to present it, and and only one time can I recall any person ever denying that they were if he ever sinned, and that was just an absurd, arrogant person that really knew better, and it's easy to point out that well, according to the Bible, if you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. <laughs> But the point is, universally, everybody knows they've sinned. Everybody knows, basically, if we're going to put it in layman languages, everybody knows they're not perfect. You could never go before God and say, hey, I've been perfect. From my first breath to my last, I was perfect. <laughs> so when people realize that they're imperfect, then, and they realize that perfection is the standard required to go to heaven, they can understand their, the problem, the predicament they're in, and that's why we need to be saved. That's why we need Jesus. Um, let me let me look over the verses. Forgot all the verses that were covered there very quickly. I'm going to read those in the Amplified just because sometimes 
it's phrased in a way that's helpful. What verse did we start with? Uh, uh, okay, at verse. Gosh, I don't remember the starting point. Okay, the verse. I'll read. Start with verse 35 in the Amplified. Um, uh, verse 36. I mean, you know the message which he sent to the sons of Israel. So, in other words, I, this is it, it's public knowledge. It was a, it was a famous uh, thing. The the ministry of Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. This is this is famous. Announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know the things that have taken place throughout Judea, starting in Galilee after the baptism preached by John how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with great power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. We are personally eyewitnesses of everything that he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem in particular. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him to life on the third day and caused him to be plainly seen, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen and designated beforehand by God. That is, to us who ate and drank together with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach the gospel, preach to the people, uh, both Jew and Gentile, that's the interesting thing about that is that he's commanded to both preach for Jew and Gentile, but they didn't preach to the Gentiles until this point. By the way, this is 10 years. I, you know, those charts I've sent you guys and studying all these timelines of these uh, events of early church history. This is 10 years after Pentecost. So it took 10 years for them to do what Jesus originally had told them to do, and it took a special vision to Cornelius and Peter for them to actually come and tell the Gentiles. He says, he commanded us to preach to the people, both Jew and Gentile, and to solemnly testify that he is the one who has been appointed and ordained by God as judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets testify about him. So this is... Uh, Jesus on the road to Emmaus, he went through the Old Testament, shook to all the prophecies about him. Uh, Paul, it was his custom to, in every city to go into the synagogue and go through the scriptures and review what all the prophets said about Jesus and that th these were all fulfilled through Jesus. So this idea that um, this is some brand new idea, it's a mystery that nobody knew about. No, the mystery that the Paul only is, um, uh, think is uh, that we're saved by grace. That's not the mystery. There's, there's a point where we're going to come to here. Um, I'm not sure if it's in here or in Galatians, but the, Paul says what the mystery is. The mystery is that, um, that the Gentiles will be included. I mean, it was throughout the, the it was not that clear and it was not understood. It was like all the things that were said by Jesus to the apostles. They heard it, but they never never sunk in. But the, the mystery was not that, uh, uh, oh, you're saved by works before, but now it's a new thing. You're saved by grace. That's what the Paul only is saying. But, the, but according to Paul, the mystery was that, uh, hey, this uh, Savior uh, uh, from, from uh, the line of Abraham, he's for the whole world. Uh, all the prophets testify him that through his name, everyone who believes in him, that means whosoever. I love the whosoever. Oh, as a matter of fact, it says here that Amplified, whoever trusts in him in, and rely. I like how this is phrased. Whoever trusts in and relies on him. That's to me what the salvation, the, the best way of, of understanding faith and believing. We're relying on him. We're admitting that we can't get there any other way. We need him to be our savior. And then it says, accepting him as Savior and Messiah receives forgiveness of sins. Uh, that, uh, that was really <clears throat> well written in the Amplified, I thought. And that's that's why I like the Amplified. It's not perfect by any means, but it's uh, sometimes they put it in easy-to-understand language, inserting some um, commentary along the way, kind of like what we're doing in this as we are commenting on the Scriptures. All right, any more th things to be said before I read further? All right, let me read on then. Now back to the KJV. Um, verse 44. 
While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, then answered Peter, <clears throat> Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. All right, brothers. Well, it's great, great stuff, brother, and thank you for reading that. Uh, and once again, we see the, the, the visual manifestation. This is one thing we see in the book of Acts, the visual manifestation of the way the Holy Spirit came uh, to those who heard the message. And verse 45, uh, the believing uh, Jews just were astonished. Like you said, it, uh, you know, we'd say today they were freaked out, absolutely amazed that uh, all, all these Jews that came with Peter and they were amazed at what? Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is another reason. This is another reason, guys. You know that salvation is not by works. It's not by repenting or, or stopping doing some... I, I like how you put it, Luke. It's not just being willing to stop sins, but it's it's stopping them. It's, it's getting rid of your sins in your life. Well, who's who's done that? Nobody does that. That, that makes salvation by works and it make it impossible. Uh, seemingly for, for a lost man to do that. But it says, what was poured out on the Gentiles, the end of verse 45, uh, was the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. It's a gift. You don't work for a gift. We talk about that in simple uh, uh, evangelistic messages, is emphasizing that, that it's not something that's worked for. It's a gift that's received by faith. And you, you quoted uh, Luke uh, earlier, Romans 4, verses 5, I think, it says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Uh, it's simply a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not worked for. Peter made that clear here. That's another reason you know you can, you can uh, see the gospel, the good news emphasized from Peter, not just Paul. And, and why were they so amazed about this gift of the Holy Spirit being poured out? Because uh, verse 46... For they heard themselves, uh, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. These Gentiles were, were praising God and, and speaking in tongues. And uh, Peter automatically said, this is obvious, guys. Can anybody, any person at all, forbid water that these should not be baptized, that they should be openly and publicly identified with us now, us Jews, guys, all, all my compatriots, all my uh, fellow believers, uh, my Jewish fellow believers that came with me here to this household, he says it in front of this, ho this household of Cornelius' servants and relatives that are all Gentiles as far as we know. P Peter makes a public declaration unashamedly in front of his Jewish brethren and in front of the Gentiles that are there believing and praising God, speaking in tongues. He says, can any man... Any human forbid water? It's a rhetorical question. It's obvious answer. Answers no. For them to be identified, baptized, publicly identified with us Jews now. These who received the Holy Spirit like we did, we received it as a gift. <laughs> they were they received the Holy Ghost as well as we did. We received it. We didn't work for it. Now it came to them in the upper room, but it came as a gift because they were believers. They're starting something something new there, but. Peter said, we got it as a gift. These Gentiles got it as a gift. How can any human now forbid water? That we're all, we're all believers. We're all, they, they've received the Holy Ghost just like us. Peter may, is still probably amazed by all this, too. His Jewish uh, fellow brethren are amazed by it. But it's an amazing thing. And uh, good thing you only took two verses there. <laughs> Back to you, brother. <laughs> yeah, okay. Brother Joe? Yeah, uh, here's where we have uh, uh, the baptism again. You know, Paul uh, said to the Corinthian, the Corinthian jailer, asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. And here we have uh, baptism 
entering in as a, a, a sacrament uh, within the church by Peter. But I, I think the difference here is that Peter is publicly acknowledging that these people are just as good as we are. They're no different. And so the, the ritual of uh, water immersion and consecration is a show to the church, the church the, which is now all Jews, that the, the uh, Gentiles are received into our body uh, just like we are, and there's no difference. And so I, I think that's why he commanded them to be baptized, not so much uh, to uh, say, hey, you need to be circumcised, you need to do it. Yeah. None of, none of that. It was a public declaration to the church that there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. And so that's why Peter, I think, uh, focused on that where Paul never did, I don't believe. And so, uh, you know, the Paul only is, would raise this as a, see, it, it's different back then. You know, it's not. They, they, there needed to be a public declaration to the church as a whole that these Gentiles are now of us. And so they're... they're uh, I don't think this is a, a, a sacrament or a, a mandate, but just a public declaration. And I think we, we need to uh, keep that in mind in today's church, too, to not forbid it and also uh, not force it on people. But uh, th those are my thoughts. Hmm. Okay, well, there's... Uh, there's a lot of eventful things, but but some of these things, sadly, people will try to turn into uh, they they try to make it a requirement for salvation, uh, like the speaking in tongues and then the water baptism, and we've said this numerous times already. We're in the tenth chapter of Acts, and we've already made a lot of progress. I hope you go back and watch this whole thing from the beginning from Acts chapter 1, verse 1, but it, it's, it's important enough to repeat again, is that uh, th this is a time in church history where what they called signs and wonders were are common and, and rampant and necessary. Uh, even in Jesus' ministry, and then later with the apostles, these miraculous signs were there, not just to do a healing and, or to feed people who are hungry, but the primary reason was to prove that this was all from, from God, and that Jesus is God, and, and, and the apostles are true apostles, and they're, tell, they're telling you the truth about God. So that's the purpose of these signs, and, it's, and this idea of speaking in tongues was a sign at that time that was gave Peter the, it was the sign Peter saw that he said, wait, hey, the same thing happened to us. So this is, you had the same experience that we had, and uh, so he he had no doubt that uh, the Gentiles were saved just as they were. Matter of fact, that's almost exactly the same words that he tells James later on. Uh, so um, the, the, this, the and then the baptism, uh, the water. I said earlier, you know that. Uh, we shouldn't ever take the word baptism and think it's a water unless it says water, unless we know for sure the context is water. In this case, it's clearly water. It says, can we, for, do we forbid water? I think it says, uh, can any man forbid water? Well, see, uh, that, that they should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost. See, here's another thing. They received the Holy Ghost before the subject of water comes up, whereas... Some false teachings today are that you, you get wet, and that's how you receive the Holy Ghost. That's how you get saved, by getting wet. But this is to say, no, they have already received the Holy Ghost, as we did. Now it's okay. Can we let them be baptized? I think the points you both made about this uh, being a public statement, not just a public statement. I've often said that this is the primary reason for water baptism for us today is that it's an, the, the first and, and, and best opportunity a new believer has, who maybe doesn't have the boldness or the oratory to go out and start preaching the gospel, but they can go out and get baptized in public in front of their friends and family, and, and uh, if they're not able to, the, the 
the pastor or whoever's doing the baptizing explains that this is a new believer. This is symbolic. He's submerged in, and, and it represents the, he's immersed into Christ. And just as Christ was buried and raised again, he is uh, buried in Christ and will raise again at the resurrection. And so this is a, this is a way that a new believer without the ability to be an evangelist can be an evangelist. It's the first evangelistic opportunity a person has. So I think that, and also I think more important than anything else you said was that we know that Peter didn't even want to talk to these people originally because they're Gentiles, and uh, and the, the 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 Jewish people and the beginnings of the church was all Jewish. They didn't want to have anything to do with the Gentiles, and now Peter is saying, "Let's let's let's we're not, I'm not embarrassed. Let's go out and public." Uh, publicly be baptized, and that way everybody will know that we're accepting them as equal to us. They're the same as us. There's no difference. So it was. It, it, that's why the baptism was important. But um, if they never got baptized, they were still saved before they already received the Holy Ghost. Just like you right now, if you get put your faith in Jesus, and you you receive the gift of salvation, you receive the Holy Ghost indwelling in you forever. Uh, if you never get baptized, you're still saved. But why not get baptized? It's a, the best opportunity you'll have as a new believer to tell your family, friends, and family about your new faith. Um, all right, that's the end of that chapter. Uh, let me see. It's uh, 347. Uh, do you guys want to um, sum this up now or go for another half hour? Or how do you feel about that today? Uh I always prefer 90 minutes, but, you know, I, I, I could go if you guys want to. Uh, all right. Well, no, if you prefer 90 minutes, and you, you know, that's so perfect. Okay, plus this is the end of the chapter. Maybe that's a, an appropriate place to, to stop at the end of Chapter 10. Um, so why don't we do that? Let's, uh, let me ask each of you to summarize the study, give any highlights of the study, uh, and then I'll, I'll give a gospel message after you're done with that. Go ahead. Well, it's an excellent passage, uh, brothers, that, uh, you know, that just uh, get, gives the inclusion of everybody that's going to, uh, that God wants to save everybody that, and that everybody is, uh, is, is savable. Uh, God's no respecter of persons. That's what I got out of this. And that uh, uh, verse 36, uh, the message is that is that God is preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He's Lord of all. I mean, He is giving the, giving the good news out that, that that there's a Redeemer, that there's a chosen one, there's a just one, uh, the Judge of the living and the dead. All these titles that are given to Christ. Uh, He's a resurrected Christ. God's done all the work. Uh, that's what I'm getting from this, and that these these Gentiles that we have in this passage are are, are ones that the prophets uh, all gave witness that through Christ, anybody who believes in this one is going to receive remission of sins. It's it's just an open door. It's showing, uh, you know, like I'd like to say, God's eagerness to save people if they'll just put their uh, their faith in this one and obviously they do they got the Holy Spirit and it's it's just a great passage of scripture brothers and uh, glad to be part of it back to you all right brother Joe yeah you know I've got my Bible has all I've got notes that I, I got all through the through my Bible on various chapters and stuff and you know from years past and this is the one regarding Walter Martin and that article uh, of, of uh, dogs and gods. But there's only one that I have written here. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's only one note here. And for this chapter, I wrote, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. And I think I got that from a, a Matthew Henry uh, commentary. And this is important for people because... This, this chapter establishes the church is for everyone, uh, that there is no Jew or Gentile, that uh, in God's sight we're all equal. It doesn't matter if we're black, white, yellow, or whatever. Uh, there, there is no difference.
difference. You you mentioned the respecter of persons passage, and and so while Israel and the Jewish people were meant and promised to be a blessing unto all men, uh, and they are special uh, in that way, and kings and priests. Uh, when we enter the body of Christ, there is no difference racially, culturally, nationally. Uh, it's the ground is level at the foot of the cross. That's that's my notes for this whole chapter. Thank you. Lee. Well, uh, I looked at the uh, the footnotes on this study in the uh, the Amplified, uh, and for verse twenty three. Is, well, first let me read it in the KJV 23. Uh, then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, I, I know verse 23 goes back to the, the, yes, the day before yesterday when we studied that, but uh, th this goes along with this point that we're making about the relationship between Jewish and Gentiles at that time, there was no relationship. This footnote says, it was extremely unusual for a Jew to invite a Gentile into the house, much less offer lodging. So, um, this, is, this is chapter here, it, it's a revolutionary thing that's, that's just happened. Uh, Jews, whether whether Brother Joe is right, I think he's probably right, that the idea of Jews not having anything to do with Gentiles, uh, I'm not sure that the scriptures tell, tell them that, or they got that from extra rabbinical teachings that had built up over the years and that Jesus called the traditions of men. But regardless of how it came about, these the, it was the custom that the Jewish people would not associate with Gentiles. So now, uh, even though Jesus had told them, and even the scriptures, the, the Old Testament prophets had said that he would be the savior of the whole world because of the light of the Gentiles, and then uh, they, it seemed to like just uh, they just didn't get it and uh, uh, maybe didn't want to accept it because there was a lot of uh, hatred. It was a racism. It was segregation. They, they considered them almost subhuman. That was their attitude, the Jews against the Gentiles. And so for them to, for Peter to go have them into his house and then to go into Cornelius' house, this was a big deal in itself. And then to preach the gospel and have them become equals and be publicly baptized, recognize they're the same as us. This is a huge thing. And then, of course, you know, I'm a Gentile. I'm just thankful that uh, the gospel was was eventually it took ten years from Pentecost to Cornelius is ten years, but finally they did what they were told to do uh, to preach to the Gentiles and and since now yeah, this is a transition that's why the Book of Acts is called a transitional book because it shows you in the very beginning of the church they it was just Jews no Gentiles and and also that the Jews would continue practicing Judaism and believe in Jesus. And the transition that we see in the book of Acts is that, whoa, Gentiles are going to be part of this. They're, we're equal. And also, Judaism, we've got to get rid of that. You can't divide your faith between religion and Jesus. It's going to be all, all Jesus. So this is the transition the church goes through in the first 30 years. Um, so, um, yeah. The gospel. We've talked about it a little bit, uh, saying that you know um, the gospel, the good news, that salvation is offered as a free gift to everyone, and it's the reason it's available is because Jesus died for your sins, and He was buried, and on the third day He raised Himself back uh, alive bodily, and that bodily resurrection proves that He is God. He He did pay for your sins. Uh, he does have the power over life and death. All of his claims and promises are true. You can trust him. That's because of the resurrection. That's the sign that we have. And so uh, it's a simple thing for you now. Um, if, if you do believe that there is life after death, that you don't just die and just no longer exist as 
some atheists believe. But if you believe there's life after death, if you believe there's even a heaven and a hell, and you you prefer heaven, well, but basically we're saying the good news is that heaven is offered to you as a free gift right now, and and uh, it's that's the only way to get into heaven is it, receive the gift. You can't go go to heaven by working your way, climbing a ladder and striving and through your own efforts, achieve it. It's impossible. The Bible tells us it's impossible. There is one way and that you can get it get into heaven. And Jesus said he's the one way. Believe in him. And he gives it to you freely as a gift. And uh, thankfully, we don't have to work for it because uh, our, our work the Bible says the works of man are like filthy rags in the sight of God. No matter how hard you try to be good and join religions and follow all the religious rules, uh, you go before God with that, and he's, that's filthy rags. You know, well, don't you know the standard is perfection? <laughs> so uh, not only would our works fail to, to get us into heaven, but uh, uh, Jesus did the works for us. He lived the perfect life. He never sinned. And his perfect sinless life is credited to me. When I put my faith in Jesus, my, his righteousness is covering me. And, uh, and then the, uh, the sins that I did commit were charged against him. So sin is not preventing me from getting to heaven because he paid for my sins. And when I go to heaven and God says, why should I let you into heaven? My only plea is Jesus is my Savior. I'm relying on him and his promise, his ability. And if you, in turn, put your faith in him, if you rely on him, then you're assured you're going to go to heaven. All right. So I hope you do that now. I hope you're convinced. When you're, when you're convinced, that means you're a believer. Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. You will go to heaven. All right. Uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we'll try to do these daily at 2.30 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, Thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.